I'm Keon. And this is Trust Your Doctor, that podcast where we run someone over with a Who-mobile. Because this week we watched the final third Doctor serial, Planet of the Spiders. Like most season finales for the third Doctor, written by Robert Sloman. It was directed by Barry Letts. And aired in May and June of 74. Right, so as we've mentioned for the past couple weeks, the third Doctor's era is now drawing to a close. Yes. No, no, no. <laughs> Weren't you sad when he regenerated, though? I know I was. I'm going to miss him, um, despite all the crap I give him. Which, obviously, we're going to talk about uh, at the end of the episode. It'll be <clears throat> great, big, pertly retrospective. Uh, but also, bringing to an end, Terrence Dix's run as script editor. He would obviously still be involved with the program, not with the television program, but he would continue to write novelizations of the stories. And then when they kind of start writing books, Terrence Dix would write a lot of books, and he still does write books for Doctor <laughs> Who, actually. He's still involved. He's one of those guys who just can never let go, I guess. Uh, and the end of Barry Letts. Almost. He actually does stay on for one more serial. Next, one more he, ser- he, he stays yeah. on for Robot. Because I think I think Robot was produced as part of the same production block as this, so it just made sense to keep them on. For... Right. Well, I know they were filming at the same time. They fil- they filmed the this and Robot at the same time. So, Barry um, Letts is on for that, and then he's also out. So basically, the end of an era this week. <laughs> right. Um, again, they they switch producers mid season. This this time I can see why, but they switch producers mid season. Yeah. Well, like they kind of did before yeah. for whatever reason they did. I mean, this time before. they have a reason to do it though, and last time it yeah. was kind of like, huh. <laughs> um, you know, obviously, I mean, Terrence Sticks has been script editor since back at near the end of the second Doctor's run, and Barry Letts came on, I think, at the same time. So yeah. they've been on for a while, and we've had we haven't. I mean, obviously, that implies we haven't had a big changeover of production roles in a while. And I guess <laughs> next week we're going to be talking about how the show is going to be different, I guess, and where that's going to go. But this week it's all about Pertwee. <clears throat> <clears throat> and Metabilis 3, again, actually. <laughs> yeah, you thought it only played that one minor, well, minor-ish role in uh, Green Death? Well, no, it comes back, which is actually really cool, because Sloman yeah. does this overarching thing in all of his season finales, yeah. um, and where they're all tied into each other. Yeah, I mean, not even just Metabilis 3, he brings back the the mentor that he even brought up way back in time, uh, Monster, when he was talking yeah. with Joe Grant in the... <laughs> In yeah, the, in the prison. Yep. So there was a lot of really kind of loose threads being tied up, and I think as a finale, it works really well. But I think anywhere else, it would have just been terrible. It was as as a as a standalone story. Well, the storyline itself wasn't anything to write home about, like the I mean, whole thing no. with the spiders and yeah, all of no. that. Which but, we're going to get to. But it uh, brings some closure to a lot of things brought up over the entire run of the third Doctor. So th- so that's what sort of made it enjoyable. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it serves as a nice ending to Pertwee, especially mm-hmm. with, you know, all the things that happened, like the chase scene and all that. Which you know? we're going to get to because it was amazing. <laughs> so, I mean, let's just jump right into the start. It starts actually... With Yates meeting with Sarah Jane, right? At at the same time as the Brig and the Doctor are at that at they're performance. Watching, they're kind yeah. of it's they kind of go on simultaneously. Yeah. The Brig and the Doctor are watching some sort of performance that you never see on screen, obviously, due to money restraints. Um Right. And meanwhile, Sarah and uh Yates your Yates has called in Sarah because Yates has obviously been discharged from unit. And um he's at this Buddhist retreat. Some sort something, of monastery. Right, and he thinks something weird is happening. So mm-hmm. he calls in Sarah, because she's a reporter. Yeah, and uh, I think also his hope is that Sarah will see what's going on and take it to the brig <laughs> and the doctor. Yeah, probably. Because I don't think Yates wants to go directly to the brig or the doctor, since, you know, yeah. he kind of pulled a gun on them <laughs> in Invasion of the Dinosaurs. So, you know, that'd be kind of awkward. <clears throat> so... The Doctor and, and the Brig are seeing his performance, and they they meet with the performer uh, after... Craig, I think his name. Clegg. Craig. Clegg. Herbert Clegg. Who is actually played by Cyril Shaps. Sharps. Shaps. Shaps. Something like that. Who, who if played, you remember, was What's in, his name in Ambassadors of Death? Yeah, the professor, the scientist dude. And he was also in Tomb of the Cybermen, 
way back when. <laughs> yeah, long time ago. <laughs> so he's around. And the Doctor and the Brig... Well, the Doctor really enlists him because I guess the Doctor's been doing experiments with psychic energy and telekinesis. And <laughs> right. Clegg claims to be able to do that. <laughs> right. And the, the Brig, you know, just for the viewers who don't know what it is, is like, wait, telekinesis? You mean explain what telekinesis is? And the Doctor's like, yes, Brig. Exactly. Hey, well, I'm glad the Brig is finally not the bumbling buffoon they made him <laughs> out to be, like, in Season 7. Right, now he's... Ex- He's the one to explain the plot device. He's at thing. least a competent He's as leader Xeer. now. He's as the brig. It all makes sense now. The brig is as a seer. No, no, no. <laughs> what? Where did that even come from? I guess from the plot summary thing. Yes, <laughs> the vaguely connected uh, plot. Summary. Oh, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> but Clegg actually turns out to be a real clairvoyant. Clairvoyant. How do you say that? Telekinetic being. Right. I don't think telekinetic is actually like... He's a, he's a psychic. Yeah. It's probably not the word really for so psychic, yeah. <clears throat> and he's and like, he, well, but I can do it. And he lifts, uh, I think he tray of... This is, yeah, like a plate or a tray or something. And he drops it. And yeah. And Brigitte is like, whoa, man, this is too weird for me. <laughs> um, meanwhile, with Yates and Sarah and uh, the monastery thingamajig, uh, I think Yates has spied his colleagues doing mm-hmm. some sort of demonic ritual in Not the basement. Not necessarily demonic. Yeah, well... It's kind of shady. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's, I mean, it's, a, it, they're, ch- they're doing like Buddhist chants, actually, is yeah. what it is. It's not like, it's not like, it's not like summoning us all. Summon- it's not, yeah. <laughs> um, not like they're summoning the, the devil again. But they are summoning something. Right. But you don't see what it is until a little bit later, because now it actually cuts to the doctor, and Benton comes in with a package from Joe Grant. Who? No, no, I'm just <laughs> No, no, no. I actually really liked this. I was like, oh, there's a little yeah, I liked throwback it too. to They don't to just Joe. forget her after she leaves, which they do yeah. for most companions. And um, not, not that they should, like, mull around and, uh, you know, quote-unquote, keep the companion alive after they're gone. But I mean, no. It's but nice that they... Yeah. And they, you know, they didn't... It wasn't a plot point that was beat to death. It's like, oh, just Joe sent this package and it's the Metagross yeah. Crystal. She, uh, and she encloses a letter and she... Um, you know, she talks about how they haven't found their fungus yet, but they're, they're still out there on their adventure. And they really hope, she really hopes that the doctor's doing well without her, and she hopes everyone down at unit is doing well. And I think she ends it with, like, if the doctor's off on some adventure, maybe you can hang on to it, Brig. But, like, if you're off stopping some third world countries and annihilating each other, maybe you can hang on to it, Benton. Or you're like, you know, maybe. if you're not around making, you're making coffee or something, maybe Yates can hang on to it. Obviously, she, does, she doesn't know that Yates has been discharged. <laughs> they should write her back saying, Yates stabbed us in the back. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but I, I think it shows the attention to detail that Joe doesn't know Yates has been discharged yet. Yeah. And, I mean, it's a very easy slip up to just go like... <laughs> Yeah, it's just can't not believe even... can't believe Yates is a backstabbing <laughs> traitor. No, 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 no. You know, but it was nice. I really enjoyed that little moment with the Doctor reading the letter from Joe. But meanwhile, Clegg is currently looking into the crystal, sees some spiders, and keels over and dies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we actually don't know what he sees until the Doctor. Um, yeah, the Doctor. Exi- the, they're using um, the doctor's using some device or another to examine Clegg's mind, and um, Clegg is about to reveal what he saw in the crystal, but he dies. So the doctor uses the machine mm-hmm. to find out that he saw some spiders. And we should mention that um, the doctor actually tested Clegg with that machine with the doctor's sonic screwdriver to see if Clegg could tell where he got the sonic screwdriver from, because previously he had correctly identified where the brig got his watch from, uh, right. and the brig seemed quite Flustered. annoyed at that. Maybe there's something going on. I think um, Clegg says he got the wife from uh, the, <laughs> the, the the watch from someone named Doris, who I think is supposed to be the brig's wife. Um, and I think expanded universe novels have mentioned that they're going through some rocky times with their marriage <laughs> around this time, so that might be why the brig's little quick to grab his watch back. <laughs> uh, but 
you know, the screen identifies the whole scene in Carnival of Monsters where the doctor blows up the swamp and gasps with the <laughs> sonic screwdriver. And then, yeah, they see the spiders on the screen and... Turns episode... out Clegg is just a huge arachnophobiac, if that's the correct way to say arachnophobe, it. Arachnophobe, I think. Arachnophobe. Um, episode one ends with Yates and Sarah seeing the ritual summon a spider. Dun, dun, dun. But not a regular spider, a giant spider. Also not giant. a surprise, because the name of the serial is Planet of the Spiders. Right. Um, not giant like Godzilla giant. No, it's just, it's like maybe the size of a small dog. <laughs> well, I mean, the great one. Yeah, well, that, that <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> um, obviously, the spiders aren't real giant spiders. They're just... The puppets. <laughs> no, they actually got real spider. No, um, <laughs> they forcibly mutated spiders. <laughs> Animals were harmed in the making of this program. <laughs> they just were conducting <laughs> eugenics experiments on spiders behind the scenes. That's where their budget went. <laughs> under the, it all makes sense. <laughs> under the pretense of it being for the television program. <laughs> It was a 10-year plan enacted in 63. It was all leading up to this moment. No, no. Old Bill Hartnell was in on it and <laughs> covering it up with his publicity skills. <laughs> but, you know, they see the giant spider and now... Basically, episode two is a combination of the chase scene where Yates and Sarah try to escape the monastery... And then when they do, the chase scene with the Doctor and <laughs> Lupton... <laughs> Right, episode two is basically just a 23-minute chase scene. But the second part of the chase scene was brilliant. Right. Um, we also didn't mention there's a guy hanging around in the monastery named Tom, who's not Who, the sharpest tool in the shed. Yeah, and you know? I actually felt really bad for him in, like, episode one, because they all, they're all just kind of dicks to him yeah so to speak because they all just kind of like tommy get out of here if i see you again and they like crush his flower that he's holding he's like tommy liked flower and i'm like oh now i feel really bad and then he did kind of make out like a bandit though because uh i guess sarah and yates didn't really want to be too mean so they're like hey tom if you go away i'll give you whatever whatever i'm whatever um well so he got he got like um well he got sarah's brooch he got sarah's brooch and he got Yates's, Yates's necklace, which actually looked suspiciously like the one the Doctor's been wearing this entire <laughs> season that we didn't really know what it was. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that could be a tie into the whole Buddhist thing that the third Doctor's kind of been about uh, in Sloman's finales. Maybe, maybe. But uh, but no, the plot yeah. point where where Tom gets stuff yeah. or, or, or is interested in like uh, jewels and stuff like that it uh, actually becomes pertinent, so... Mm-hmm. But becomes pertwinant. Didn't we make I think that I made joke that before? Already. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Tommy, <laughs> one of my favorite characters in the serial, actually. What? Kind of becomes I, awesome at the end. Yeah, I guess. Um, I guess. But at the beginning, he's kind of just yeah. this innocent guy. He gets the stuff from Sarah Jane and Yates, obviously, and they eventually, they drive away. We've got to mention, as they were driving there, the truck that just appeared out of nowhere and then disappeared, that Almost ran them off the road. Right. Um, they kind of deduce that <clears throat> the uh, the dudes at the monastery sort of summon this apparition of a truck because um, they they they're they're subtly or not so subtly actually hinting to Yates that he better not meddle in their affairs. Yeah. Meanwhile, there's actually this. I think he's supposed to be a Tibetan monk named Choji mm -hmm. who's hanging around. And I don't know. I was. I think the serial sort of. Uh, Tries to lead you into the belief that he's in on it with them. I think but, so. I think Choji is the assistant to the abbot. I think that's his official position, at least. Right, but you find out who he is later. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, it's not what you'd expect. Not what I expected, at least. Well, yeah, it's kind of out of the blue. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you could have possibly guessed unless <laughs> you just randomly took a stab in the blue and, and happened somehow to be right. Yeah. But, you know, so Tommy... This kind of disappeared with the stuff. You know, Sarah Jane actually seems to be pretty chill with Tommy, and Yates just seems to want to get him out of the way, but anyway. Yeah, well, they both seem to be pretty okay with just giving him probably expensive jewelry for no reason, but... It's because he's obviously go. mentally handicapped, I guess. 
the lights um, are on, but no one's home, I think is the term. No, I don't know. I don't think that's the term. <laughs> um, well, Yates and Sarah are like, okay, let's leave. While the cult, I guess, uh, kind of is talking to them. And then they you sneak back in through the window. Uh, you know, see, Lupton is kind of the leader of the, the guys. Yeah, he, he's the leader. Um, and they kind of overhear Lupton talking about needing things mm. and wanting the crystal. So like, okay, well, we better go back to unit. So they go back to unit. Well, they don't know he needs the crystal, but they do know Lupton is planning something big. So they go back to unit and then Sarah Jane spends, spends a good three minutes trying to explain to the doctor what she saw and he's not listening because he's busy investigating the crystal. Yeah, very fitting for uh, the, th- the third doctor's final serial, just straight up ignoring people. But Sarah Jane mentions the spiders, and the doc's like, wait, what did you say? Spider? Well, I guess this really is uh, linked, I guess. Right, so they decide to head on over to uh, the the country house. And this is where the best part of the episode starts. You know, normally I'd probably complain about a twenty. This was t- th- like the 13 ten minute. minutes. Ish. Ish. It depends where you... Counted consider, as, yeah. yeah, it depends what you consider part of the scene. But I normally complain about a chase scene this long, but you know, in the third Doctor's final serial, I think it was kind of fitting. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Lupton has snuck in. He's zapped someone with electricity. Right. Apparently, he can do that. Um, we've seen the spider controlling him already, yeah. haven't we? Yeah. The spider we didn't mention, but the spider they summoned attaches itself to Lupton's back mm-hmm. and sort of disappears or becomes invisible or something. Yeah. And they sort of sort of like share consci- a consciousness, I guess. They can yeah. hear each other's thoughts and can communicate with each other. And uh, apparently he now has the power to force lightning people. But <laughs> I don't know. I, I just half expected him to uh, start slinging webs all over the place. And, you know, you know the Spider-Man hand symbol <laughs> thing, whatever it is. Doesn't seem Clearly to be any. I don't, I don't think there's any like two story buildings at you no. to sling off. They no. all look like one story buildings. <laughs> Especially the doctor's lab. But, you know, he busts in, he knocks out Benton, steals the crystal while the doctor and Sarah Jane aren't looking. And then uh, as he's running away with Benton and the doctor and Sarah Jane in pursuit, he steals the Whomobile. <laughs> um, so the doctor and everyone else hops into Bessie uh, mm-hmm. and try, tries to catch up with him. And it's just kind of sad because, you know, Bessie is obviously no match for the Whomobile speed wise. And you see that here because they never you know, even get close to catching up. But they drive along some roads for a little bit. And then a a, a cop just, I guess, sitting there, you know, some sort of municipal the policeman, who acted terribly, by the way. This actor is one of he's a few... He's not the worst actor in the serial. <laughs> Sad to say, but he's not. Uh, he joins in on the chase. Um, and then it finally comes to an end. Well, or so, so you, you think... think. They make it to kind of an airfield, and um, the doctor gets into a helicopter, and, uh, well, the doctor's actually in a helicopter from approximately the beginning of the chase, and the brig right, and Benson the doctor and gets into, um, I think it was G-A-V-X-K or something, I don't know. Right, he's pursuing from the air, telling the brig where to go, and it gets to, they get to an airfield, and Lupton thinks he's caught, and the police pull up, and he's like, not right now, I need a statement from you guys, and like, not right now, we need to deal with this policeman. <laughs> And uh, while they're not looking, Lupton steals the helicopter. Yeah. And the doctor and jumps into the Hoomobile with, with Sarah. Sarah Jane. And, and they take off. Yeah, it turns out the Hoomobile can fly. <clears throat> in, a, in a Back to the Future one final one minute-esque moment, turns out the Hoomobile can fly. While... And travel through time. Wouldn't be surprised, actually. The doctor did build the Hoomobile, I think, I guess. It's implied <clears throat> he built the Whomobile, isn't it? I guess, yeah. It's, I mean, it's never flat out stated, but it's pretty much implied. I mean, he's like... It first appeared in, what, Invasion of the Dinosaurs? He was like, can't wait to use that new method of transportation. Yeah. Or something like that. And uh, when the brig's shooting at Lupton, trying to stop him, the, and he gets into the Whomobile, the doctor's like, stop, you're going to ruin my car! <laughs> um, you know, but they fly in pursuit, and Lupton is controlling the helicopter because the spider apparently knows how to fly helicopters. <laughs> and they land, and you think the chase scene is over again. <laughs> but nope! This time, Lupton steals a boat! 
<laughs> and then Octa steals another boat. Like there's some, I guess, fishermen just not beached, but I don't know what the <laughs> correct term is. They've pulled up their little dinghies on the shore of the lake, and they, the doctor and Lupton, steal their boats and have this chase in the water and. and Chase moves on to land. The mobile almost run. I think it's supposed to be like some sort of. I think he's implied to be homeless, and the guy just napping out in the field. The, the yeah. doctor sort of runs him over. Not runs him over, but it's uh, he 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 goes over him, but the guy's unharmed. He just gets up. He's like, "What was that?" Yeah, that was actually in the boat, and not the mobile. Now I think about it. Was it? Yeah, he steals that hovercraft boat that was basically he... just the mobile, but a boat. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, he does. Huh. That's okay. We've had inaccurate intros before. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, yeah, he runs over a guy, and the guy's like, what just happened? Uh, and eventually the doctor jumps into the boat, Lupton's in, and Lupton vanishes. And that's the cliffhanger. <laughs> Lupton just disappears. Yeah, the cliffhangers in this were a little iffy. You know, the, like we said, the story isn't anything to write home about. Um really padded out and wouldn't really have worked with all these touch without all the nice touches that sort of concluded the third doctor's era just would have been another mediocre yeah, serial the where the doctor just kind of points at the gods wasn't <laughs> your favorite cliffhanger in the whole show i'm pretty sure my fa- my favorite one was where sarah is wrapped up in the web and she just looks at the doctor and rolls her eyes when she realizes she's yeah that's what i'm talking about oh it is yeah because he yeah. just points to the gods and sarah's like oh <clears throat> <laughs> well, we'll get there. That's episode four. So hey, episode it three. Have, it, it wasn't worse than the doctor saying, look at the floor. <laughs> in uh, in um, Death of the Daleks. <laughs> Jeez, the audio drama I'm listening to right now has the best cliffhanger ever. So cliffhanger is like... Uh, oh, no, right, the doctor's going to die. No, 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 right before the end of the episode, his companion's like, you're not going to sing, are you? And he's like, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> and then he gets to the end of the episode and he's, he's about to sing. She's like, oh, you are going to sing. And then it ends... <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good <clears throat> so anyway part three begins Lupton actually reappears at the meditation center um uh and and nobody sees him just randomly appear but Yates well Tommy actually and Yates both see him there at the the monastery again back and they're like what what's going on and uh lupton goes to meet with his his home dogs <laughs> in in the planning room and he kind of leaves the crystal on a windowsill and tommy saw lupton with the crystal earlier and he really likes it and he thinks it's pretty so what does he do he steals it <laughs> uh right he puts it in a box where apparently he keeps other jewelry slash jewels slash pretty things i think that crushed flower was still in there oh really yeah. Uh-huh. And the doctor and Sarah Jane decide to go back to the meditation center because that's where they were going originally before Lupton decided to steal the crystal. <laughs> and Cho G is like, no, but Lupton was here the whole time. There's no way you could have stolen your crystal. Right, furthering your suspicions of Cho G. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um so Pretty exactly what happens, but Sarah runs into Tommy, and Tommy tries to tell her he has the crystal, but she's like, not now, Tommy. Well, she goes, well, because the doctor and the brig and Sarah Jane, I think, are talking with Choji, and Tommy kind of calls Sarah over, and she goes over, and he's like, I have a present for you. But then they overhear Lupton telling someone he's going down to the cellar, um, and she's like, uh, sketch, sketch. <laughs> so she's like, Tommy, tell them I'm going into the cellar. And he's like, but wait. And she's like, no, no, I got to do this. Tell them I'm going into the cellar. And he like pulls out the crystal while she's not looking. Like half of the cereal could have just been avoided if Sarah (laughs) Jane had waited like a minute. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah Jane. (laughs) Thanks. Um, But they do the kind of ritual again. And Lupton and the spider get transported. uh, Spider still on her back. uh, To Metabilis 3. Right. And Sarah kind of steps on the mandala and also accidentally gets transported to Metabilis 3 right as the Doctor and Yates show up. Right, and you find out this is, um, this isn't episode 3 now, I think. Yeah, this is episode 3. Episode 3 began with him at the oh, monastery. Um, and it ends with the Doctor getting shot with the lightning bolts. Yeah. Um, you find out 
uh, Metabulus 3 isn't the hostile jungle world you thought it was last season. Well, he, the doctor says, well, when he's examining the crystal, he says, well, maybe there was a time difference between now and when I actually got to Metabulus 3 earlier. Like, maybe I got there before civilization had developed, which I think is what he eventually says, like, straight up says it to Sarah Jane later. And I think it's heavily implied also since, you know, the civilizations we see on Metabulus 3 are both from Earth. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> But it's... The the planet's got, you know, multiple types of terrain. It's obviously... You mean Old I mean, West Town number six? Yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the gunfighters reborn. Um, yeah, uh, the mutants reborn. <laughs> Not really, but... Um, they, Sarah shows up in the midst of some weird town with humanoid-looking creatures. Yeah, who, who are, are humans, humans, actually. But we don't find that later. out. Um, and the spy, the spider queen shows up and wants, I guess, someone in the tribe for not paying the tribute to the eight legs. So you're not allowed to call them spiders on Metabilis 3. That word is forbidden, but we're going to use it because we're not on Metabilis 3. <laughs> you can't do anything to us, eight legs. No, no, no. Um, right. And we didn't mention that the spiders were actually voiced by, uh, the same... Lady who did the voice of Alpha Centauri, and also Delgado's wife, Kismet Delgado. Yeah. Kismet, how are you? Pity, Say it. pity that Roger wasn't around for this serial. Right, this serial, or the, not this serial, but the third Doctor's final serial would have been completely different. Yeah. If he was. This serial specifically would have been different. I mean, Pertwee hadn't decided to go out by the time they wrote what would have been the final serial of this season that involved the monster sacrificing himself to save the Doctor. Um... Obviously, when Delgado died and then Pertwee decided to leave, they had to completely change all of that to this. <laughs> Which might explain why it sort of feels like it falls flat and isn't... Well, it's not as grand as the war games. Um, yeah, but it is more grand than Tenth Planet. It's more the doctor it's does more, the doctor does more in it, this yeah. than the Tenth Planet, which is why I think it's a better regeneration story than Tenth Planet. But as a but as a story itself, I'd say Tenth Planet is more interesting. It's well, more, yeah, it's more interesting it's than tenth, the Spider. Tenth Planet brought up a lot line. more cooler plot and it lines introduced and, the Cybermen. But no, I see. Yeah, my I, favorite I, villain. <laughs> that's not an individual person. Yeah, no, but I agree with you. Like as as a final serial for a Doctor. Like, this is a lot better since the Doctor just doesn't fall off the map halfway through the serial, but, you know, as a standalone story on its own, I'd say Tenth Planet holds up a lot better. Yeah. But either way, um, right, the, the, the humans haven't paid their tribute, so the spiders want to sacrifice this guy named Arak. Arak. Yeah. Might have been a play. Now that I think about it, might have been a play with Arak or something. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point, actually. But his dad <laughs> offers to go in his place because yeah, his the dad eight legs do that. Sabor. He, I don't, same, I don't know their names, to be honest. Yeah, um, same name as the leopard from Tarzan. I don't know why I know what? that, but yeah. <laughs> why do you know that? <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, Sabor's wife comes out and <laughs> she has to be straight up the worst actor this show has ever seen. I'm sorry. Lady, I don't know your name. You might be a really good actor in other things, but your performance in this was just absolutely horrific. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to disagree with that. It was so flat and just depressing. <laughs> <laughs> That's really all I have to say about it. I couldn't be that unenthused if I tried when my husband was going to die if I was her. <laughs> She's just really unenthused trying to be enthused, and you should just go watch you it know, if you really want to see it. really doesn't even sound like she's trying. She's kind of just flatly saying her lines like she doesn't want to be there. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't. Maybe she's like a hobo they found on the side of the street. I really, really need another woman part. Do you want to like do this? But then again, I think a hobo would be like, yeah, money, and would actually be like, try or something. So, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Yeah, well, that... (laughs) 
Maybe we should cut some of this laughter out. <laughs> no, I'm going to leave it all in. Leave that line in, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, after he's about to get taken, the doctor shows up and... In the TARDIS. Yeah. And is able to, I guess, avoid some of the lightning bolts and... He goes, and right, pulls out his Venusian Aikido. The, the spiders have human guards who can shoot lightning bolts. So Presumably he, being controlled by spiders. Yeah, so. he knocks them all out, most of them. And then, um, like, well, we're going to kill you now. <laughs> and they zap him and kill him. And now he spends the next three episodes waiting to be Jenna. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the first Doctor. Um, <clears throat> Sarah Jane, this isn't episode four. Sarah Jane, again, freaks out that the Doctor's dead. Really, stop doing well, this every se- Well, this it's I I'm gonna give it a pause this time since it is his final serial. Well, I can understand why she does it, but I think what I mean more to say is the writers need to stop having this yeah. happen every serial. Yeah, they they do. <clears throat> um, it's kind of it's I think it's weakening her character because it's turning her less and less from that strong-willed woman that she was when she was introduced more into. She'll break down every time the doctor dies. Which, I mean, she, it shows she cares, but at the same time, she's going to do it every single time the doctor appears to be dead. Yeah, I mean, you think she would have learned her lesson by now, like, oh, look, the doctor appears to be dead. Well, I guess he's probably not, since he wasn't the past 20 times he, I thought he was. Yeah, kind of <laughs> also at the same time lessens the impact of the regeneration scene, because she's cried over him dying so many times before. Maybe at this point she's like, you know, maybe... Well, it's three weeks later. So. Yeah, but still, it's kind of like maybe this time she's thinking, you know, he'll be fine as usual. Where I just think yeah. it, I just I just think she's more she's less emotional there because it's it's three weeks later, which is fine. I'm tired of seeing her break down every time like this. So, I mean, it show like I said, it shows she cares, which is good character development. But it's just beat a little into the ground at this point. Kind of like how she just beats the Lyra over the head with her, <laughs> with, hey, you're a woman, you can be strong too, message. Uh, so, night falls, and apparently there's a curfew in the town, but Sarah convinces them to drag the doctor inside, even though they're all like, no, no, the doctor's dead, it doesn't matter. And um, the, the spiders also realize that Sarah is an outsider. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it... I think it's right before the doctor shows up, because that's why they want to take her. Right, but she disguises herself and blends in with the crowd. Well, she's inside, and the spiders are like, there's an outsider here. And they're like, no, don't go out there, you'll be killed. And she's like, well, I have to, because otherwise I'll just kill all of you guys. And she puts on that cloak. Yeah. Um, But, right, they bring the doctor back in, and uh, the main characters here are all uh, Arok's family. Mm -hmm. His dad, his mom, his brother, and I guess his sister. I guess that was the blonde-haired lady. Wasn't that the mom? No, there was a younger... Oh, who showed woman. up briefly. Yeah, who had, like, one line. But um, the I think Arok's brother, I, I don't know his name, but he's the one who who's all gung-ho about killing the spiders. He's kind of like, what's his name from last serial? Edis? Edis? I think it was Edis, because Gebek was the other guy. Yeah, um, Edis. Yeah, he's kind of like Edis, where he just wants to go storm the spider citadel or whatever it is. But they explain what's going on here. They are on Metabulus 3. It turns out this is some sort of Lost Colony. And I actually love, like, Lost Colony uh, storylines. Like um, where... Roanoke. Yeah. The, um, the first colony in America that just kind of disappeared off the map when they came back. Uh, well, later. I'm talking about, like, sci-fi space colonies, but... Well, yeah, they use Roanoke in stories a lot. Um, sci-fi stories specifically for some reason. Well, probably because it's a clear parallel, but um, it turns out... The humans here are survivors of a spaceship crash, mm-hmm. and the spiders are also survivors of the spaceship crash, and they've mutated and become super smart and are now the overlords of the humans. Thanks, Metabilis 3. <laughs> uh, the doctor, in his coma like state, is able to tell Sarah Jane about a machine in the TARDIS that can make him better, I guess. Uh, surprise, it's just not the sonic screwdriver, to be honest, but... <laughs> so she makes for the TARDIS, and... I mean, Arak doesn't... Arak and his brother don't want to let her go, because if she goes, she'll get killed, but... She goes anyway, she gets the machine out of the TARDIS, only to be caught by the guards. Yep. 
And uh, at this point, Arlok is like, wait, she said this guy can help us. I'm going to get that machine, and there's nothing you can do to stop me, brother. He's like, okay. I, I guess he went out because his brother called him a coward at some point. Yeah, they get into a little bit of an argument. And I guess he wants to show that he's not a coward. But he retrieves the machine and, and saves the doctor. <clears throat> right, and the doctor... Um... Again, doesn't very fitting for the third doctor. Doesn't explain anything. Just tells him to go out and find some pebbles. Well, he, he explains it as he has when he gets the pebbles. Yeah, he doesn't take long to explain it like he does in Ambassadors of Death or something like that. But eh. like uh, I, like we said before, I think a lot of his character development was sort of undone when Joe left, which makes sense. But yeah. it's also a little disappointing. But right, he needs to find the pebbles because. He needs to find a crystal that's on par and power with the crystal that he found last season finale. Yeah, but it's the opposite. That can reflect the energy. Of Something like that. Surprised he didn't say reverse the polarity. <laughs> um, right, but turns out the crystal... They do eventually find a crystal with enough power to absorb the lightning bolts or whatever they need to do with it, and they find multiple of them, I yeah. think, eventually. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the doctor's like, okay, I'm going to go in and try to rescue Sarah Jade, and you guys can, like, storm off the woods and, and rescue your father. Sabor. Zab- Sabor. <laughs> and uh, the doctor goes in, and L- Lupton is there. <laughs> they recapture Lupton. Because I mean, we forgot to mention, Lupton and, and the spider have been trying to bluff their way past all the other spiders <laughs> by saying that they definitely have the Metabilis crystal. And then they're like, wait, no, you don't. It's on Earth. Like, but we know where it's hidden, and you wouldn't kill us because... We know where it's hidden. <laughs> right, the the spider controlling Lupton is actually sort of a defector as well. Kind of. Well, I didn't really understand the spider politics in the yeah, serial. It got yeah. very convoluted and confusing. And at well, the they end. come back in some books and some audio dramas, so... For some weird reason. Right, they're really not too compelling as villains, I guess, but... I guess I can see why they brought them back, but I, I'll explain after the final episode because that would require spoiling that entire regeneration um so the doctor goes to rescue sarah jane lupton gets captured again the doctor gets captured <laughs> they're um, all captured there's the cliffhanger the least we exciting cliffhanger before. ever where the doctor just kind of points at the guards when he comes in and sarah's all happy and she's like oh doctor <laughs> uh, sarah's kind of wrapped in a cocoon and she's learned she learned the history about the humans and the spiders from sabor right while they were hanging out Getting waiting ready to, to be die. Eaten. So in episode five, the doctor escapes from his cocoon using a method taught to him by Harry Houdini. Uh, I actually know what method he's talking about because I read about it in the book once. Mm. It's like if you tighten your muscles when you get like um, roped up or constrained in something, and then when you loosen your muscles, uh, the, yeah, the bindings more... will be looser because yeah. you become slightly bigger when you tighten your muscles. It's what the doctor did. <clears throat> Makes sense to me. He also spent like five minutes trying to come up with Houdini's lost name, but you know, <laughs> moving on. Uh, he is well. He escapes, uh, and they well, the spiders want the blue crystal. Uh, the doctor escapes, and uh, Sarah Jane has been taken, and she meets up with the the queen. Right. One yes. Of the, yes. I think the, it's queen. the queen. And, um, right, it was it was a little confusing at first because there was the queen and then the great one. Well, the great one is like well, huge. you don't see the great one until until uh, six, so you right. don't really know what's going on. So right, uh, well, five actually. Well, you don't see it in five; you see it in six for the first time. But in five, uh, the doctor enters the cave, and the great one is like, "Don't proceed any further, doctor. You will die." Like, the radiation in this cave will burn all your cells and you'll die slowly. And he's like, hey. Um, and he's just like, is that fear I sense? You're not used to being afraid, are you, Doctor? Hmm? <laughs> she's like, no, 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 no. She's like, bring me the crystal. Go! And he's like, okay. So he leaves. Uh, meets up with Sarah Jane. She's like, let's go. Okay, we're going now. Bye, guys. Let's go. Okay, let's go, Doctor. Okay, going in the toys. Bye now. Right, these final two episodes... Had a lot to do with the doctor confronting his fear, mm-hmm. which I guess was semi fitting. I liked it, but it was also semi weird because, like, the third doctor has always been portrayed to be like this super competent and uh, unflinching. Well, guy, I think that's so. why it's 
fitting as a regeneration story for him to be a for there to be something that he's afraid of you know i guess and to show that under that tough steely exterior mm. of the third doctor there's there is someone who is who can be afraid underneath yeah i just wish i like that but i just wish it had been more touched upon just before his final two episodes because <laughs> it felt a little bit out of nowhere here um maybe if they just touched upon it briefly prior to this well they there, there was, there was the, the scene in the mind of, of evil with the with the machine where it's showing his fears and, it, and there's you know the the world dying from inferno and then there's the the Daleks and the Cybermen show up and Coquillion shows up. <laughs> I guess. Know. Yeah, I guess. Um, but they make it back to the meditation center and they meet with the abbot Kenpo Rim- Rinpoche and he cryptically seems to mention that he knows the doctor. We haven't mentioned the scene where Tommy looks into the crystal. Right, Tommy uh, looks well, into the crystal and becomes super smart. Well, they're being... well. He's, they're being jerks to him again. They're like, can't you read? It says, do not disturb. And he's like, I, I'm trying to read. My mom sent me some books. And then he looks into the crystal and he can read. And he's like, wow, it, I can read, but it's, it's no use. I don't understand the words. Better go talk to the abbot. And there's my favorite line from this serial. Where <laughs> they're being chased by the group who have redone the, the ritual with Yates filling in for the extra person. And they all have spiders on their backs now, except Yates. And they're escaping and they were getting shot at, and Sarah's like, wow, Tommy, you're just like everyone else now. And he's like, I sure hope not. <laughs> uh, but they make it to the Abbot, and Tommy des- decides to stand guard outside. And uh, uh, Yates, Sarah, and the Doctor talk to the Abbot, and the Abbot cryptically mentions he knows the Doctor. Right. Um, or he sort of hints at it. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, the cultists outside are... Well, they're right outside, and they're like, step aside, Tommy. But he's like, nah, so... (laughs) Well, no, he does it more stoically than that, obviously, but uh, he says he can't because he needs to not let them into what's going on inside the room, But so they decide to zap him with lightning. Yeah, because they know the crystal's inside. (laughs) Uh, So that that, that ends part five with Tommy being zapped by lightning. (laughs) Episode six starts with him being zapped by lightning, and... (laughs) Uh, the doctor and the abbot talk for a bit, and then the doctor kind of realizes that the abbot is his mentor from. Well, that he mentioned. Well, yeah, that he mentioned in Time Monster. monster. <laughs> it's pretty confusing. We were discussing this before. It's pretty confusing. There's Time Monster, Time Warrior, Time Meddler, uh, and surely more to come. But, <clears throat> right, this is the doctor's mentor. Right. And his fellow Time Lord. Uh, actually, the reason why he's in this serial is so that they can introduce the concept of regeneration again before having... Per- we do it since the- we haven't had an on-screen regeneration since Hartnell to Troughton. Right, and this is actually the first time they use the term regeneration. Yes. Um, it's. I think they... I could have sworn... I'm not sure if I'm correct, but I could have sworn they don't explain regeneration but they briefly just semi mention like oh yeah time lords change their appearance and stuff like that yeah well the well the second well, doctor the, se- me- sec- the second doctor said it's like a renewal of sorts yeah but i think sometime during the second doctor's run like all, sort of after the first regeneration he's like oh well it, well time lords change their appearance they don't really go into it at all they, i think they just kind of mention it i could be wrong i it don't was know a, well, they weren't named time lords till the war, war games weren't they yeah, you're right. Maybe I'm just completely wrong. I don't know. I could have sworn they touched upon that, but I'm not going to go back and check because that would require watching a lot of episodes that I've already seen. So anyway, or the, just ab- it, the but- abbot is like, so you know what has to be done, Doctor. And it's like, is there no other way? And he's like, no. And then Sarah's like, give me the crystal. <laughs> no. Give me the crystal. Because the, the abbot reveals that he has the crystal because Tommy gave it to him. Uh, meanwhile, outside, Tommy's just getting zapped by lightning and Right as they're, I guess they're about to finish him off, Yates jumps in front and is like, no! <laughs> and gets zapped in the stereotypical take the bullet for someone else fashion. Also the stereotypical, oh, the camera's rolling, stand here for one second before I jump in front of the lightning fashion, which isn't stereotypical at all, but happens here. So there you go. <laughs> right. So the doctor's like, okay, well, I guess I have to do that. They eventually, 
they get Sarah to stare into the crystal and the spider dies, I guess. <laughs> I the guess. Queen dies. Uh, and Sarah's like, I'm sorry, Doctor. She's, she took over. And the Doc's like, ah, don't worry. Also, the abbot, I think, mentions at some point, he says something cryptic, like, not all spiders are on your back. And the doc- Sarah Jane is confused. And the Doctor says, he means that none of this would have happened if I hadn't brought the crystal back. Right, yeah, the Doctor also has to sort of confront his greed here, I guess, I think he calls which, it. Yeah, uh, which I think is kind of weird because... Does he mean it wouldn't have happened like no one would be in trouble? Does he mean it wouldn't have happened because Boss would have taken over the world and the Green Death if he hadn't brought the crystal back? There's like Maybe a little a bit of both. But... There's a weird trade-off where it was like, was it worth it to bring back the crystal to save everyone from Boss or not? Well, I don't, thought this was actually really weird because I don't think the Doctor's greed has ever... not like not well, in the first, first second or third. He says his but... greed for knowledge, not like his greed for earthly possessions. Yeah, but still, I don't think it's ever been brought up as a problem ever not a problem per se but you can you you see in his character a lot that he wants to know more i guess he does kind of tell people to buzz off when he's trying to uh, investigate Mm -hmm. but yeah that comes into play here and like i said before i kind of wish a lot of this would have been touched more upon before his final episode Right, well, so the Doctor takes the TARDIS and he leaves Sarah and everyone behind, takes the TARDIS to Metabilis 3. To uh, go confront uh, this great one. obvious bad scene where he meets up with uh, the humans again. He's like, oh, so your assault was successful. I'm like, yeah, we'll take you to the cave. And they take he takes them to the spiders and he's like, so I guess you lied then. <laughs> And then the spider's are like, we'll kill you now. He's like, but I've got the crystal. You wouldn't dare kill me. I'm going to take you to the Great One. They're like, oh, praise the Great One. <laughs> right, so they, I guess he gets escorted to the Great One. Um, yep, and he walks into the light. radiation. No, no. <laughs> into the radiation. So he begins his slow and not painful. really painful, I guess, death. Uh, he gives the crystal to... The Great One. The Great One reveals is going to use it to complete this crystalline web it's constructed, but it needs one more crystal, and the web will amplify the Great One's... Psychic powers or something like that. And uh, the dog said, like, you've built a positive feedback loop. You're just going to blow yourself up. <laughs> and she's like, be quiet, Tule. Give me the crystals. The dog's like, okay. Right. If we, we briefly touched upon it before, but it wasn't clear the Great One is just a giant version of the regular spiders. Which giant are giant version. versions. <laughs> um... The doctor gives her the crystal and she plugs it in and it blows up. The, <laughs> the, the humans are free and they escape. Presumably all the spiders die. We saw a lot of spiders die on screen, but uh, yeah, and There's I guess... at least the four on Earth. I don't know if all the ones in the chamber actually ended up dying. They all just kind of started freaking out and flying <laughs> across the room. I imagine them off camera picking up the puppet and like <laughs> chucking it into the camera's field of view and just flies <laughs> past. Um, but there you go. The doctor, so the doctor gets in the TARDIS and then it cuts to Sarah Jane and the brig. Three weeks later. Although you don't know that yet. Uh, the brig mentions. Until well, the Sarah's brig is like, like, it's been three weeks since the doctor left, but don't worry, he'll be back. Yeah, Sarah's like, I don't know why I'm here, you know. Uh, we forgot to mention the Abbot actually regenerated, uh, like. In, into Choji, because it turns out Choji was just a projection of his consciousness. Yeah. Or something like that. Something I guess like he can do that. <laughs> well, he travels through... He has a greater power than the, the Doctor, I think. The yeah, Doctor he does. Mentions. Um, so they make a... They crack a joke about the Doctor borrowing a TARDIS to escape. <laughs> um, you know, so the he regenerated, and Sarah saw this, like, oh, regeneration. Now, the, the Brig and Sarah are talking, the Brig's like, well, you know... He disappeared for months once, and when he came back, he was an entirely different person. Like, But I'm sure that won't happen again. No, no, he doesn't say that. <laughs> well, the way he says it makes you almost think the TARDIS will just show up and, like, Tom Baker will fall out as the Doctor. But, Which no, is almost exactly what happens. Almost. almost, but they do give the Doctor time to say goodbye to the Brig and the third Doctor to say goodbye to the Brig and Sarah Jane. Yeah, just barely enough time. Because, I mean... The TARDIS does materialize, and yeah. the Doctor, Pertwee, does fall out. It's not yeah, well, yet. Sarah Jane thinks she's all okay because she knew when the doctor left that he was going to his death, basically. Um, so he kind of stumbles out of the TARDIS, falls down on the ground. 
he uh, he talks to Sarah and the big and the big's like bring me some snarky remarks here which was fitting i guess yeah for like an end to the third doctor uh the third the third doctor says his final lines which i think are uh a tear sarah jane don't cry while there's life there's and then he kind of regenerates well he dies actually uh he says he's the quote finishes while there's life there's hope uh which sarah jane actually mentioned last week uh that the doctor says that quote a lot i don't know if you remember that when did she say that uh the first time the Doctor dies in Monster of Peladon. She says, like, the Doctor always says, well, there's life. Oh, yeah, there's... no, no, I do remember And that. then she doesn't, she also doesn't yeah. finish the quote in the exact same way the Doctor doesn't finish it here. So there's some weird, kind of interesting parallels there. So, right. So then you see well, Pertwee that... fade out and Baker fade in. Well, not yet, because the Abbot shows up. It's like, don't worry, the regeneration just hasn't started yet. Like, All right, that weird astral projection of the... With Choji mm. slash the Abbot, he shows slash up and he's whoever like, "Whoever this guy freaking is," but. <laughs> he's like, "Don't don't worry, Sarah. He, he'll be back. He'll be a different person, and you may see his behavior as a little bit erratic for a while while he gets used to it. But don't worry, I'll give him a little bit of a push to get the regeneration going." <laughs> so he kind of does a thing, and Sarah's like, "Wait, no, come back!" And then the Doctor begins regenerating, and then the Brig says. Well, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> he ad libbed that line apparently, so good on right, you, Nicholas, Nicholas Courtney. <laughs> That's actually a pretty good line for right there. And <laughs> Pertwee fades out, Tom Baker fades in, and cut to the end credits. Yep. And that's the last of the third doctor. Uh, and to come to think of it, I think the brig is the only one so far who's th- seen three incarnations of the doctor. And Benton. And Joe. All in the three doctors. Okay, well, other than that, pretty sure, like, no one else has gone through three of them. Well, like, Yet. he's worked with them, like, on a one-on-one basis, I think is what you're saying. Not, like, well, met them all at once in the Three Doctors type thing. Yeah, well, That's, I mean, if you're counting that, then the Brig and everyone else has seen, like, it. well, the Brig's seen every incarnation of the Doctor. Yeah, so far, at least. Um, the Doctor, well... Let's see. Well, Ben and Polly worked with one and two, and the big has now worked specifically with two, three. Quote unquote worked. Presumably with. four. <laughs> I'm assuming he doesn't just regenerate, jump into the tunnel, it's like, peace out, guys! <laughs> just leaves. I'm assuming he hangs out on Earth for a little while still again. Um, right, cons- but like we keep mentioning, we don't really know what's coming next. Right. The Doctor says an interesting line, I think, uh, when he shows up. That he's, he was lost in the time vortex, and when the TARDIS kind of figured it out, the TARDIS brought him home, um, which is interesting. He, I guess he considers Earth kind of home to, to him. Well, himself. I mean, if you read, uh, what was it that we read last, The Gathering, if that's any indication, all that was written like 30 years, years later, 25 years later. So obviously they're just touching upon what was brought up here. Uh, yeah. So... So he obviously has a fondness for Earth. I mean, if yeah. he didn't pick up on that through his past three incarnations already. Then... And him just straight up saying it like yeah. early in the first Doctor's run. But um, yeah, apparently, according to expanded universe stuff, the Doctor spends ten years wandering around the time vortex, probably in a before returning. Probably to Earth. in a half dead daze, where he's like, "What's going on?" <laughs> he just didn't realize it was ten years. Um, yeah, I think he he might have also done that because he didn't want to just keel over and die in the middle of an adventure with Sarah Jane. And he, like, he, d- he wanted to spare her that, but he wanted to say goodbye, so he went back like right at the end instead of <laughs> traveling with her for a while and then keeling over just in the middle of a story. Well, who knows? I'm sure there's more information about this out there that we don't know about yet. So, you know, with that regeneration, the third Doctor era comes... To a close, and obviously we need to do a season retrospective and a third Doctor retrospective. Uh, that's, well, I guess, I mean, we, the season one, we should just start with that, because it'll probably be like, a, well, the season happened, but... Yeah, well, it was, uh, obviously Joe wasn't here anymore, so... Yeah. A lot of the third Doctor's character is different, whether that's... Actually, because Joe left or because because of writers, who knows? But 
it is what it is, and he, right. it kind of made me even more ready for the third Doctor to leave. Yeah, which he we, has now. We got Sarah Jane, obviously, uh, who's been pretty good, but we'll reserve judgment on her for, you know, when she leaves in her retrospective, whenever that is. I mean, I guess as a character, I like her more than Joe, but I mean, say if she were to leave now, I know she doesn't, but say if she were to leave now, I'd probably say like, in hindsight, yeah, I liked Joe better just because she was here for longer mm -hmm. and uh, impacted the other characters more, the Doc, uh, the yeah. Brig. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think, I think overall I'm going to grow to like Sarah more than Joe, most likely. Well, I don't really know how long she's here for, so maybe she leaves next serial, actually. <laughs> that would suck, I guess, actually. But, you know, who knows? So, yeah, that's really all we have to say about the season, actually. The season was just the Doctor and Sarah Jane wrapping up loose ends, really. we Really, we, this serial just wrapped up loose ends, you know, which was it's one of its few redeeming qualities. You know, we wrapped up Yates. We got a Dalek cereal, token Dalek cereal <laughs> for the season. And we got a pretty terrible return to Peladon. <laughs> I mean, that's right. this season in a nutshell. I wouldn't say it was less enjoyable than season seven. But I wouldn't say it was more enjoyable than any other Third Doctor season. Uh, poor Liz Shaw. <laughs> uh, so... I guess that brings us to the big one, the third Doctor retrospective. Right. Only our third Doctor retrospective yet. Yeah. Um, and it's always going to be that way. So <laughs> the fourth Doctor's retrospective will be our fourth. Yeah. Fifth will be the fifth. Yep. Yep. Um, so, um, the last few times what we've done is we've listed off things we wanted to talk about. Um, in relation to the Doctor... Like, you know, favorite lines and scenes and mm -hmm. stories and locations and things like that. And we're doing that again. Well, obviously. We actually put some vague thought into, into these retrospectives, <laughs> unlike the companions, mainly because the Doctor is kind of the main character of the show, and he yeah. deserves that much at least. So what do, what do we have to begin with? What do um, we start with? Well, we're not doing... I don't think we're going to do the exact same thing we did last time. No, um, we not always the exact mix same it up categories. a bit. Yeah, and I don't think we're going to go in the exact same order, but why don't we just do favorite lines first, because that's a Favorite line. Well, that's, that's yeah, that's an easy um, one. And the last few times, we split it up into comedic lines and serious lines, uh, or, or dramatic, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, but this time, the, the ones I wrote down over the third Doctor's run were mainly comedic. I think you did, too. I have one or two serious lines written down. I have a serious one from the master. I don't know why I wrote that down, but it is. In the we third can talk Doctor's about era. the master too. We can talk yeah. about Delgado's master here. Well, we're going to talk about villains in a second off to quotes, I guess. That would, yeah, we can do that. Um, well, my my favorite uh, comedic quote actually does come from the master, and it's uh, flying. This must be like flying a secondhand gas stove. <laughs> <laughs> Still the my favorite line of this era, at least. I don't know. I, th I thought a good one came out of Green Death from uh, from the Doctor. At least we can analyze this slime. <laughs> I, I think it was, I think he said that because they they sort of lost the maggot, but they had the slime or something. Uh, I also I, I actually also have one from the Brig, which I guess makes more sense than one from the Master Way uh, from the Daemons. Well, I'm not just going to sit here around like a spare lemon waiting for the squeezer. <laughs> I guess um, I guess this time we're going over a, a bunch of quotes because I have some more. Um, well, I, I wrote down, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I have six quotes here, and I think two of them are serious. Yeah, I've only got four, and uh, one of them is from the master. But um, if we're going for comedic ones here, um, I remember in Inferno, the doctor was um, jailed. For a bit and mm -hmm. he, he says to a prisoner read any good police records lately i liked that one <laughs> yeah uh none of my other comedic ones are any good uh, so. and i don't think any of them are really very no, they're, good, they're, really, but... they're really just kind of funny is the point of the comedic lines they're not really the best written lines in this show but they're they're kind of there to break up the monotony and just really? kind of get a little chuckle Remember, out of them in uh in the mind of evil the the brig sort of ignores 
uh, I think Yates and Benton. Mm-hmm. And the doctor says, yes, it's going to be one of those days. <laughs> well, that just wraps up that whole big Benton <laughs> and Yates relationship. <laughs> so, uh, well, the one serious one that I think is actually good uh, of the ones I wrote down, or better than the other one, is uh, from Frontier in Space, where the doctor's talking to, I think it was the Draconian King, where he says, uh, fear is the greatest enemy of them all. Fear leads us to, to war. Yeah, it must have been when he was talking to the Draconian King. Which has a actually a weird kind of tie into this serial. Yeah. Uh, Whether they were going for that or not is... Uh, we can pretend like they were. Yeah. <laughs> and that's good enough. It makes the show better if you just pretend like they were. <laughs> because it gives them some sort of more overarching kind of... Continuity there. Continuity, right? But, uh, yeah, know. that's interesting. Um, I mean, the, the other one I have is the one about courage from Planet of the Daleks, where he's talking to, uh, what's his name? Oh, yeah, and that I can, one I can that finally I talk about. I can finally talk about what I wanted to talk about since that episode that I forgot to mention in that episode. Um, those one-on-one scenes with the Doctor talking with just one other person were actually Pertwee's idea. And the reason he kind of pushed so heavily for them is because he, wanted... he wanted to be the main character and be all cool and everything. Kind of, but it was mainly because he wanted the third Doctor to have some sort of character development, and he wanted those scenes to be kind of a gateway for there to be character development for the third Doctor, because it was e- it's easier to build character development when the Doctor's talking with just kind of one person than it is to kind of build it over an entire serial where he's rescuing the world again. I guess, but in a lot of those scenes, it seems like he's just sort of pushing his ideology on others. He helped them, but it was a little pretentious of him. He's a time lord. Third Doctor overall is just a little pretentious, I think, and that was part of his character. It's a little bit funny, so... Obviously, we'll, we'll talk more about that when we finish covering uh, some of the good other things that aren't related to the Doctor, like right. villains. Right, the master. The yeah. The best character of these uh, five seasons. I still like the big, but anyway. <laughs> I like the master more than the third Doctor. Some people do. It's just... <laughs> He's kind of a lovable rogue. You just I love guess. to hate him. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, as an individual character, I'd say he's my favorite villain of the show so far. But yeah, he's far and away my favorite villain, and including like including all villains bar none, he's my favorite. Yeah, I like the Cybermen. <laughs> uh, I kind of I kind of wish we had gotten a Cybermen third Doctor story because I am super curious to see how the third Doctor would kind of handle the Cybermen. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, obviously back-to-back Cyberman serials isn't exactly a good idea, so I can see why they'd stopped doing things like that, but well, maybe they, they should have brought them back at least about, once. They did, like, once a year for the second Doctor's run, didn't they? Yeah, they, that, they had, they had back Wee, Wheel in Space, sense. and they had the Invasion. And I, I guess... One serial part. One, you know, one yeah. serial in between. I guess the reason why they wouldn't do a Cyberman serial is because it, it would fall into probably being the same as the Invasion since the Doctor was stuck on Earth for most of his run. Well, they were, Yeah, that's true. And they were just getting tired as enemies, pretty much. Um, there is one Cyberman story with the third Doctor, only one in existence in every medium. There's an audio drama uh, spoken by Caroline John before she passed away, part of Big Finish's Companion Chronicles range. Haven't listened to it, got no idea if it's any good. <laughs> But it exists. Uh, but I do really enjoy the monster, and I really enjoyed his his banter and his relationship with the Doctor. I think some of the best scenes from the third Doctor's run were scenes where he was talking with the monster. Yeah, of course. And because, you know, he's supposed to be the Doctor's counterpart. His, right. His evil... Uh, his evil twin, almost. I mean, they're not twins, his but... His rival, I guess. His um, mirror image. And Delgado, this also had a lot to do with Delgado's acting, because I'd say Delgado is one of, if not the best actor on this show so far. Well, we, 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 Patrick Troughton was pretty good. The Doctors are all really good. Well, Okay, let's, well, let's just exclude the Doctors from this count, because they have to choose a good actor for the Doctor. Okay, well, all the Companions were pretty good. I mean, they pretty much have to choose a good well, actor I mean, for the Companions, too. Dodo, Katarina. <laughs> but I'd say Delgado... I like Delgado as the master... In terms of acting, probably more than anyone else on the show. I think uh, I think it'll be interesting to see. Well, because mo- the monster's a time lord, obviously. So will the monster return in a different form? Yes. <laughs> I mean, unsurprisingly, <laughs> like really, even I know that. Really, not that difficult to see that coming. <laughs> um, but m- when it might have been back in the day. 
You know, you might not have, That's especially true. if you hadn't known Delgado would die, you might think, oh, maybe he'll appear again. Well, I mean, even if you if you knew Delgado would die, you you probably actually write it off, like, oh, I guess the monster's not coming back. Right. And, I mean, unless you were a super fan of the show and you, like, put the pieces together after watching Planet of the Spiders, like, oh, Masters of Time Lord 2, maybe mm-hmm. he'll regenerate and stuff like that. But you'd have to wait for months to find out, so... Probably even more than just months. I don't know when he comes well, back. So yeah. it could, could be years, potentially. Yeah, I don't... It's already been a year. He came back in uh, Frontier in Space, and he hasn't been back since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, at least at least a year. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see. I also... I, it, it's kind of also a pity that Delgado, you know, died. I, I think it would be interesting to see a, a, a Delgado master versus pretty much any other Doctor except <laughs> the third... I mean, obviously, it probably wouldn't be good. Like, every pairing you can think of probably isn't good and it's just going to be fan servicey. but it's always interesting to see, like, if you took a villain that's known for being one Doctor's error and then transposed it against another Doctor to see how they'd interact. Right. Del- Delgado versus uh, Troughton and Hines. There is a novel interesting. about that. <clears throat> Maybe um, we'll read it one day. I'm actually curious to read that novel. Hopefully it's not like forty bucks used. Like no, I think I think that one is in the twenties. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is a sought after novel because of the fact that it has the master and the second doctor. <clears throat> yep. You know, but uh, obviously. So, so I mean, other than gushing about the master, <laughs> um, well, we got we got other reoccurring villains. We got the Autons for two serials. Yeah, they were. We wished they did more with those. Yeah, there was a lot of potential with the Autons, I think. The Nestine consciousness specifically, too. Um, mm-hmm. They kind of fell flat a little bit. Uh, hope they return, I guess. I know they do return, actually. Well, they, uh, show, at they least. show up in the reboot, at least. Yeah, um, that's what I was referring to. We got the return of the Ice Warriors in the yeah, third Doctor's run. and they played with your expectations with the Ice Warriors, too. You know, they thought you you might have thought they would be uh, up to something, Curse of Peladon, but turns mm-hmm. out, no, they're actually not, and they sort of played with that again. We're in Monster yeah. of Peladon, where they actually kind, are Kind of something. the only redeeming quality of Monster of Peladon. <laughs> um, no, but I think what they did with the Ice Warriors was really good in these serials. Obviously, taking them away from Earth kind of brought a whole new facet to their characters. Yeah, and they weren't just... Uh, you know, the power-hungry villains they were before. <laughs> right. Well, for at least one serial. <laughs> at least one serial, uh, right. And I found out they were green. I thought they were black. <laughs> so, thanks, color. The uh, I actually rewatched the the episode with the Ice Warriors in the reboot the other day. And uh, I haven't, it, when I first seen it, I hadn't seen any of the Ice Warriors from the classic. And now yeah. that I've seen all of them, and I, I just recently rewatched it, it... Kind of interesting. There's a little. There's a few references there that uh, huh. I kind of enjoyed that they threw into that <laughs> that's, that episode. Um, we also got uh, the Silurians and the Sea Devils, right? Uh, Another recurring villain. We liked them a lot. I mean, if you want to, once again, there was a lot of potential there that kind of got it got a little bit wasted in the Sea Devils because they had the monster there, and there was kind of that what are we doing with these villains type thing going on? But I mean, that was kind of just the, the trope of Delgado's monster was to team with some alien menace and then <laughs> just get way in over his head and not realize that they're going to turn on him. Yeah. You know, that, that was kind of the trope of his, uh, his character. And then obviously I think the big villain that we can't go without mentioning the return of the Daleks. Yeah. For the, for the first time in, what was it? Six or seven years. Something like that. You know, I'm too lazy to calculate the exact number, but it was a while. It was four years, I guess, or three, three or four years. Uh, so they appeared in season nine, and I think they lost appeared. They appeared in Evil of the Daleks, which so was season the, what, five. Season four was the finale for season four because it it, oh. it it introduced Victoria. It was immediately following the Faceless Ones at the end of season four. I think. Yeah, well, if you if you were watching these like back, yeah, Evil of the Daleks was the season day, four, then you so. got that rerun of Evil of the Daleks like a year later. Uh, <laughs> oh right, in the Wheel in Space, right? <laughs> yeah, between Wheel in Space and um, Dominators, Dominators, but we're not counting that. So yeah, so it's, it's been like four years between Evil and then Day of. <laughs> Obviously, they kind of just became tired out again because they used them once a season. Once they brought them back, we got we, yeah. you know we got Day Planet and then Death Two and 
of the three, I'd say Planet of the Daleks was probably the best. Kind of tied with Day of the Daleks. They were they were good for different reasons. I think. Mm. I wouldn't say any of the third Doctor Dalek serials were as good as the second Doctor ones. Well, no, but I mean the best of the third Doctor serials. I'd say day of the... <laughs> day of... Uh, eh, I'd say day of... Or, well, death to the Daleks is yeah, obviously well, the weakest. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Between planet and day, I don't really know which one I would enjoy more. I'd, I'd say day. Yeah. I'd say day. Um, but that's up to the individual. Yeah, well, obviously, <laughs> you can just like Planet of if you really want to, but uh, or no, not Death Two, Death Two. If you want, we're not going to stop you. That's like all the villains we are that we got. Stop you? No, no. There was the super OP ambassadors of Death. <laughs> <laughs> there was the uh, weird mutated things and the lava in Inferno, the magma, whatever it was. Um, uh... <laughs> Inferno. But, um, yeah, I think I just want to say right now that I think season seven, I think before we transition into talking about our favorite scenes, I think season seven was probably the weakest season of the show ever, overall, so far. Probably, and I think maybe that comes with they introduced a new Doctor and they did it very poorly. Yeah. I mean, Spe- and- Spearhead from Space wasn't a bad serial, but I think the serials immediately following it, trying to continue... The introduction of the Doctor kind of all failed. And maybe and also just Liz all... Shaw and the, the Doctor was kind of really a grating dynamic to get into coming right off the heels of the Doctor and Jamie. Well, yeah, Liz Shaw wasn't a particularly interesting character, first of all. And also Pertwee didn't, I think, didn't exactly... He knew how he wanted to portray the Doctor, but wasn't exactly what I wanted the Doctor to be like. I think also he was kind of... He hadn't nailed it yet in season seven, and I don't think, you know, the whole situation with all the serials really helped that. I think he leans too much towards being a jerk rather than having... Because cause that's, that's, that's one of the defining characteristics of the third Doctor. He's more abrasive than the second or first. Um, I mean, you can still tell that he cares a lot about people. It was difficult to tell that he cared when he had Liz Shaw because Liz Shaw was just so stoic and kind of stone-faced in the face of danger. Well, I mean, not only that, but I think he was a little bit more... more, uh... I think the Doctor himself was just more stone-cold in Season 7. Obviously, they're also trying to play off the fact, like, his TARDIS doesn't work (laughs) anymore. Like, he's trapped here on this planet. Like, yeah, he has a fondness for Earth, but he doesn't want to be trapped anywhere that's why he left Gallifrey because he didn't want to be trapped on Gallifrey that's why he <laughs> borrowed a TARDIS and now once again he's trapped somewhere <laughs> and I think he was kind of a joke for a while because he was trapped <laughs> I think if anyone starts watching the third doctor I would suggest starting from season eight and then watching season seven when you finish the third doctor's run just for completion's yeah. sake but I would definitely recommend yeah. starting from Terror of the Autons at least because one, it has the Master. Two, it's season eight, so the Doctor's at least better. Three, it has Joe Grant, so... I guess. I mean, after watching eight, nine, ten, eleven, would you even want to go back to seven? I don't I don't think so, but that's up to you. <laughs> Again. But yeah, I think in terms of you know, favorite scenes and storylines, which I guess we're going to talk about now, uh, it's a little more freeform than we've done it before. Uh, which is okay, but um, in terms of that, I think I'm, we're, we can just throw season seven out the window here. Like we're not even going to mention it in terms of favorite s- stories and scenes. I'd say. I yeah, mean, I don't. I don't think it failed as a serial. I think Spearhead from Space. That is. I mean, Spearhead from Space would be the one, only one I'd pick scenes from. I enjoyed Ambassadors of Death for the most out of that season. Seriously. Yeah, I've mentioned this on the show before, and you've had the same reaction, because you enjoyed huh. the Silurians. Yeah. Um, I mean, of that season, the, the Ambassadors of Death is not by far my favorite serial <laughs> of the third Doctor's run. I mean, if we're talking favorite serials, I have to love three Doctors, just for how fan service it is. Yeah, I'd say so. And also... Um, just seeing Trout and Hartnell both back on screen, too, was just amazing. I mean, well, Trout and specifically Hartnell. Hartnell. I've said it before, but they could have done. I mean, well, with yeah, but you know, he him. was sick and he did what he could. So you know, 
I yeah. think I just enjoyed seeing yeah, him back well, on screen. Yeah, to be honest, discussion is for that episode. I think we can uh, leave it at that. But uh, no, I mean in terms of actually favorite enemies, what we were saying before. Um, what's his name? Uh, Omega, Omega, Omega. Um, he was interesting. Uh, I just liked his over the topness when he realized everything was just going to pot. Just no. <laughs> <laughs> Not possible. No, no, he's not Lou. Um, I think what he says, well, if I can't control everything, then I'll destroy everything or something like that. Um, <laughs> and his costume um, was cool. <laughs> it, it was cool. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I mean, one of my favorite stories of, of the third Doctor's one was the mutants. Uh, yeah, it was okay. Agreed. How do you, how do you say egregious? I think is how you say it. Uh, plot holes uh, aside. Aside. <laughs> um, Deus Ex was, Machina aside. Uh, I liked that serial. It had a lot of lore. It had, I think, more thought put into it than a lot of other serials, and it did a lot more with the backstory rather than saying, "Here's what's happening," and here's just one event after the other. But no, this tied tied it into sort of a backstory with the planet. I and, uh, enjoyed uh, Green Death, actually. Hmm. Green Death was pretty good. Well, you also, loved Joe, so I can yeah. see why. Um, Chris Peladon was pretty good. Yeah. I mean, we it, got on its case a in lot. The, a lot, especially in... In the episode we the did episode on it, where we argued Mon- for like ten minutes about Peladon and Joe. And in Monster of Peladon, we also yeah. sort of got on Curse of Peladon's case. <laughs> but uh, looking back, I just like what they did with the Ice Warriors there. And it introduced Alpha, yeah. so... Alpha Centauri, best character. <laughs> um, no, I mean, those are the ones that I kind of enjoyed the most. You know, Green Death, Cosa Peladon, Ambassador of Death, if I had to pick one from that season. <laughs> um, and I, of the monster stories, I'd probably say Terror of the Autons, to be honest. Just because it introduced the monster so well. It did, but not Time Monster? I mean, of the monster season, not just of the oh. monster stories. Okay, if we're going one per season, then I'm just going to say Silurians. Um, let's see here. This one's hard. It's obviously the Claws of Axos. Either Claws of right? Axos or Daemons. Um, <laughs> season 9. Mutants, obviously. Mutants mm-hmm. is my favorite third Doctor serial. Um, let's see here. Let us see here. Three Doctors, and then... Well, this. obviously, the th- Three Doctors. Invasion of the Dinosaurs from Season 11. I would probably actually agree on that one. <laughs> um, yeah, I, pff, not really much more to say about serial specifically. Uh, I guess do we mean, can transition... Do you have any favorite scenes in scenes? particular? Uh, uh, the dinosaur fight, since we just brought it up. No, no, no. Um... Uh, I mean, well, you can't forget um, the Jesus, space <laughs> Jesus from the mutants. You, just, you can't forget it. <laughs> that's that. Maybe it's just because I liked the mutants a lot, but that's just immediately what comes to mind in terms uh, of favorite the, scenes. The scene with Joe in the jail and Time Monster. Yeah, yeah, and how how the, that all tied into. Uh, here in the regeneration scene, obviously, and when they're talking to uh, Kanpo mm-hmm. here at the end, um, right, right. Obviously, obviously, right at the end of Green Death. Yeah, the, that's probably the, the farewell scene. Yeah, I'd say that's probably. Well, no, I'd I'd say it actually is my favorite scene of the entire Third Doctor's run. Probably is. It was just so well written and directed and well acted too. Yeah, well I think well acted is more to do with it because yeah. it's, it's literally just the final scene is literally like no lines, nothing. It's just yeah. drive away looking sad and he pulls it off. It's not like he just drove away emotionlessly or like with a smile on his face, you know, one hand on the wheel, <laughs> hair blowing <Brosting>, like <laughs> rap. <laughs> <laughs> just waves to the guy in the car next to him, like how's it going? <laughs> Um, um, yeah, so well acted, I'd say. I think that's a good transition into talking about companions. Uh, Liz Shaw, once again, she's really not that interesting of a character. Yeah, and I mean, the only other two we have to choose from are Sarah Jane and Joe. 
So, really not much of a choice. <laughs> so, like I said before, Joe holds up, in my opinion. I got yeah. on her case a lot. She, I think you got on her case a lot because you wanted her to be better. Yeah, and she got better. And yeah. I think you mentioned it last week or the week before, but Sarah Jane does seem like a natural evolution of what Joe would have been had she yeah. stayed on. Um, uh, it, I mean, it's pretty much what Joe ended up being in Green Death. And, and then she got it. axed. To a lesser extent, Frontier in Space and Planet of the Dogs. I think Joe, I think Katie Manning just needed a break, and I think she wanted to move on to other opportunities. Third Doctor having way less variety in companions in the second yeah. and first, actually, now that I think about it. Well, second had Jamie all through, but he had, he had a lot well, we more. Had, we had in... Victoria, Zoe, and Ben and Polly. Yeah, I mean, he he stayed with Jamie, but uh, there's still there were more. And then the first Doctor. Yeah, the first Doctor was just all over the place. Is there anybody you could pick up, really? <laughs> Please come with me. No, no. Well, I mean, yeah, pretty much. The, you know, the scene where Stephen bails, he's like, everybody always leaves in the end. <laughs> you know. Even when the Doctor's trapped on Earth with, with the companion, they still leave. <laughs> oh. Um, uh. Right, so... <laughs> Liz Shaw, I'd just say, was probably if we're if we're talking bests and worsts here, which we're supposed <laughs> to be doing. Liz Shaw was the worst companion so far of the whole show, or just the third Doctor's run. The whole show, even worse than Katarina. Yeah, really less impactful than Katarina. Hmm. I'm not gonna like look back. Katarina, <laughs> Katarina has something to remember her by. She's the first companion That's to die, true. and she sacrificed herself. Liz Shaw was just kind of there and didn't even show up in her final serial, like a but lot she of she was a characters. scientist. Yeah, well, if she was... I had to make that joke. <laughs> the third Doctor's retrospective. It'll never be relevant again. <laughs> um, right. I mean, if we're talking least favorites, too, we should have probably mentioned this, or I should have probably mentioned this. Um, the whole Earth Empire thing was introduced here. And, yeah. Uh, that was... It could have been delved into more as a little uninteresting, actually. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's just because the serials themselves, the storylines of the serials themselves that this appeared in weren't exactly entertaining to me. Like Colony in Space, nah. Frontier in Space was... Yeah. We liked it, but um, that's probably because of the master, <laughs> to be um, honest. So Yeah, we didn't talk about worst serials, but, you know... Season 7. Monster with <laughs> Peladon is up there, for sure. <laughs> um... Yeah, well. Anyway, there wasn't anything that was like explicitly like massacre level bad. Yeah, no, there wasn't. In, the, you know, the, in this run, surprisingly, first doctor had massacre. Second doctor had um, Fury from the Deep. Fury from the Deep, which I accidentally called underwater menace. Called I call accidentally called Fury from the Deep underwater menace last week. So sorry mm-hmm. for that. But no, there wasn't anything that bad this time. Maybe that's just a tribute to Terrence Dixon Barry. Let's at least doing some sort of preliminary screening and rewriting on scripts. Uh, as they came through the office, uh, there was Monster of Peladon, but Th- that wasn't even close to being massacre level. I'd no. say no, uh, um, but it, you know it was kind of a poor outing as a Doctor Who serial. <laughs> I it was, but I guess on the bright side, even the worst serials of the Third Doctor's run had some redeeming qualities. So yeah, which isn't to say they were all of them were good, but so good on you, Ted Sticks, <laughs> as script editor for. Making them not suck. It might have also had to... Might have also been due to the fact that there are no more uh, recons, so... Maybe. Yeah, maybe, but I think we'd probably still hate Massacre if it existed. Yeah, I'd say so. But uh, also, thanks to the fact that there are no more recons, we got to see the sets a lot better. And this season had really good sets. uh, Compared to... Comparatively. We had uh, one of the ones that stands out as the Doctor's Lab... Which yeah, well, that was reoccurring multiple times. So it's it, like the first time you see it, it's not really anything special. But you keep seeing it again and again. And you're like, oh, mm-hmm. this is, it's it's the doctor's lab. It's like it's where he yeah, it's where he chills. Just kidding. Um, but uh, no, <laughs> where was, he has his molten ice. <laughs> um, there was the Silurian base. I we conjectured that that was reused multiple mm-hmm. times, and that that looked really good. It looked like a prehistoric underground cavern which was supposed to so that was i think we thought were used in colony in space and the weird city thing yeah uh and obviously if you're talking sets there's no way you can just go without mentioning 
the claws rock of, quarries. Oh, I was going to say Claws of Axos because that one was also really no, good. No, Claws of Axos was good. If we're talking about good, I, Claws of Axos was pretty fantastic. But you can't go these sets without mentioning no, the rock quarries. You can't. It's, even you, it didn't even it even seeped into the thir- uh, three doctors. So you just obviously just, they're working on a budget here, but a lot of third doctor serials took place in rock quarries. So it's just kind of it's cheaper to go out to the rock quarry and say we had a rocky <laughs> planet. Than to like go into the studio and buy trees and build Spyrodon every single time you want an interesting planet. Right. And I think that's why Spyrodon sort of stands out here, why we mm-hmm. said we liked it. Because there are so many rock quarries. Um and I think a lot of a lot of it had to do with like, yeah, the sets were good. The ones that were good were like really good for the era because I guess it's in color now, so they felt they had to step it up a little bit. Mm-hmm. But that might have also been why we had so many rocky set places set in rocky uh pl- rocky planets mm-hmm. i don't want I was trying not to say rock quarries but yeah rock quarries um, i mean that's what they are <laughs> um maybe that's why they had to kind of go that route because they put more into the sets i guess you know yeah, color I, some more detail i think also still budgetary con- constraints you know this show obviously being a pretty big success now into the third doctor's run uh being a lot more widely known they're gonna get more money to work with, but that's not to say they're rich, mm. you know. Yeah, I mean everything's on a budget. It's a television program, so. And obviously, uh, the show will become huge once we get to the fourth Doctor. Maybe because he stays on for seven seasons, <laughs> uh, you know. But but we're gonna be ready for him to leave too when it's well, when yeah, it's time. We'll always be ready for the Doctor to leave. By the end, I mean, I wasn't ready for Troughton to leave. I wanted like three more seasons of Troughton. <laughs> well, as you were watching the War Games, weren't you just like, this is kind of drawing itself out of it? I mean, yeah, War Games was good and it was paced well, but didn't you just kind of feel like, you know, I wish they'd just get to the end? Nope, I loved War Games. <laughs> we're gonna be, we're gonna be tired of pretty much every Doctor at some point. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. I'm just being a uh, snarky. <laughs> But no, I actually, I actually do want, I did want more Trouton, but alas. Anyway. There's always the audio dramas. There's always the audio Frasier dramas. Frazier Hines does a pretty fantastic Trouton impression, apparently. Not surprising. <laughs> yeah, considering, I guess, Jamie's near the age that Trouton was, I guess, when he was that time-ish, Suppose. maybe. Probably maybe about 10 older. years older, maybe. Yeah. Um. So do we want to talk about our expectations of the third Doctor? <laughs> uh... Did we really have any? I think because we went into this like, okay, it's color. So the show might entirely change from what we've known. And we didn't really know what to expect because you didn't see the regeneration at all. Right. And we had change in staff, obviously, around mm-hmm. the beginning, sort of that season. Um, right. So we didn't. It's, it's kind of the same as we're kind of the same. We were kind of the same back then as we are now. We don't really know what to expect going mm-hmm. into the next season because we're trying not to spoil things for ourselves. Right. Um, I hmm, I don't exactly remember what I what exactly I expected, so maybe it was just nothing. I, I, I don't think we had any major expectations. I think we were just curious to see how Pertwee's Doctor was going to be compared to Troughton's. Because, I mean, at that point, we'd only seen the Hot and All the Troughton thing and... Hard and all the trout, and there was obviously a carryover of some elements. You know, the outfit was pretty similar. Some of the second some doctors, personality traits. Yeah, some of the personality some. traits carried over. Whereas here, there was even fewer personality traits carried over. Yeah, um, obviously the show format uh, changes. We knew that. So, right. and I think I want to say I, that I said back then it would be less interesting, and I was kind of right. <laughs> For a while. I think we For- just got such a shock with the third Doctor's character that we tuned out of season seven just completely. <laughs> um, I mean, that's kind of my only I, I, expectation, I guess, <laughs> that I would have had was off to spearhead from space. It's like, well, I guess the third Doctor's going to suck, which he <laughs> didn't actually, like, suck, suck. He was not my favorite, but I don't think he sucked at all. Well, for season seven, I'd say that's another story. But no, I wouldn't say he sucked. Absolutely not. I think he's just a... For us, at least, he was a difficult character to like. Obviously, some people really enjoy the third Doctor. I can see why. He's a lot more active than either the first or second Doctors were. (laughs) He likes to get his hands dirty a lot more. 
obviously, I guess we're transitioning into talking about the Doctor now. I suppose. Um, well, we kind of have been for this entire... Almost touching this up. Is there anything time. else we want to talk about? Do we... I guess we can end with expectations for the fourth Doctor so we can actually have something to talk about for his retrospective. I suppose, because he did appear in... Uh... In season twelve, uh, season eleven, my mm-hmm. bad. Of course, he appears in season twelve. He's the main character in season twelve. <laughs> he does appear uncredited in at, in the final episode, like we mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, like I just said a minute ago, you know, expectations going in here. Not Nothing much. I'm, much. I'm just. I haven't looked anything up production wise because I'm trying to just get. Well, I mean, look that I, up as we go along. I looked up obviously the episode lens, and I saw that Barry Letts stayed on for Robot. That's all I know, except. I think this will be the first Doctor that we're going into in which I've actually seen a story from them. Yeah. I think I saw... I started Spearhead from Space like a, two weeks before we got to the third Doctor, but I've seen one serial from the fourth Doctor's run uh, mm-hmm. at this point. So I kind of know to expect, sort of. I just hope... He's... He's less abrasive than the third Doctor. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's what I want. That's all I want. I don't want him to be a clone of one or a clone of two, but I just want him to be. A... I mean, every doctor should be their own character, but there should be elements of the other characters in them. Right. I mean, what I'm trying to say is I want to change from the third, definitely, mm-hmm. but I don't want them to go back to one or two. Yeah. I just want I, a more they, likable they character than three. They shouldn't retread yeah. all ground kind of thing. But which... I want him to be a more likable main character than than three turned out to be. I think Not we just I think we just didn't even. like three because it was coming straight off of Trouton and we really enjoyed Trouton. It probably has something I th- to I do with it. I think if we'd like started with three, I mean, I know I know Nathan from Flight Through Entirety mentioned that I think it was Nathan that three was his first Doctor, so he agrees that he's abrasive, but like it's kind of nullified by the fact that he's his first Doctor type thing. Yeah, and I mean, I think Hartnell was my first Doctor that I saw, so. I mean, another fan maybe who hadn't watched any First Doctor serials and went back to the mm-hmm. First Doctor might be like, wow, this is really boring or something like that. Or really grumpy. I mean, the First Doctor is really grumpy for a lot of yeah. his serials. But I still like him. Uh, it's that First Doctor syndrome. But I do like Troughton more, so I don't know how that plays into it. But I mean, you, you always have some lingering... Basically, your first Doctor always gets brownie points because they were your first. (laughs) Like, Ten will always have brownie points to me. Even if I like another Doctor more, Ten will always have brownie points. Um, But yeah, other other than hoping he's more likable than three, I don't have... He also gets gets the scarf. Well, he has the scarf. (laughs) That's not so much an expectation as it just is a fact, so... Um. I'm so I love the fourth Doctor's outfit. Out of all the outfits in the classic series, I think his is just amazing with the scarf. Well, he's gonna have celery. <laughs> Throwback <laughs> to seventy six episodes ago. Uh, well, yeah, I, the celery is kind of ridiculous, and I love it because it's ridiculous. But no, the fourth Doctor's costume is something to look forward to. I think that, that that's my expectation is not the third Doctor. <laughs> Hopefully that turns out to be true. I don't want what seven more seasons of. Uh, I think I think his first serial he'll be a bit erratic. Well, all, the, all the second Doctor was and third Doctor. Yeah, I mean, but it's kind of the I guess post regeneration trauma. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, it's gonna make a PTS. In, in 11, Eleven and twelve were both really erratic but... in the first episode too. Yeah, I think that sort of a trend 10, that was started actually. possibly after Troughton decided to do that mm-hmm. in his first episode. So maybe he started that. Possibly. Um, possibly not even thinking that, oh, I'm going to play the Doctor erratically because he's just recovering. Possibly that's just was just how he wanted to portray the Doctor at that time. <laughs> Good thing that didn't continue. We probably <laughs> would have hated Troughton if he had just played Power of the Daleks Troughton for yeah. his whole run. Yeah, probably. But <laughs> But there you have it. Another era over. Last, yeah. at the end of the second Doctor, we said, okay, this is sort of an era of Doctor Who, you know, first and second. And I'd say third alone is another era done. Yeah, uh, I've been thinking for the past few weeks that he's kind of just the James Bond of the Doctors. Yeah. Uh, and the only reason I bring that up is because of the Who-mobile and reading that the part we just really loved spy gadgets and, you know, kind of had a moment of, oh, wait, he's totally the James Bond of the Doctors. Yeah, he is. He's totally the guy who just runs in gung ho and goes yeah to take out all the enemies. Whereas Hartnell definitely wouldn't do that. Nor Trouton. 
points for being unique, at least. Obviously not our favorite, but I think he was good in the well, end. In the end, yeah. he became pretty good. I think I could watch a couple more seasons of season 10, Pertwee. Uh, yeah. The, like, Three yeah. Doctors, Screen Death, Frontier in Space, Pertwee. Perhaps if Joe had stayed on. And we mentioned, I mentioned it in her retrospective. I wish they'd just keep one companion per one doctor. It allows for better character development, I believe. Yeah, uh, you know, obviously there's limitations on whether they can do that just because of actors yeah. and... Stuff like that. Stuff going on behind the scenes that things don't always pan out exactly as you want them to. Sometimes you're just like Stephen Moffat and you come up with an overworking storyline for your entire Doctor's run and it requires the companions leaving halfway through <laughs> and then coming back the immediate next episode. And well, then, we'll get there. Yeah. And whenever we get there. <laughs> Damn it, Moffat. I don't hate Moffat. I just hate some of the things he's done. Anyway, um, do we want to place him i mean after the first and second doctor we're just kind of like well second's obviously better so second above first but i guess should we place the third doctor in our rankings now i think we can and i think after a while i've I've mentioned this a couple times on the show but i find like rankings above like three four maybe five is the most i'd go but i find anything over that just completely arbitrary well i think also doing a ranking now our ranking is going to change later because you always kind of look back on an error and then you you kind of remember things that you hadn't noticed when you were watching it or you look back on like maybe watching recons and you're like you know what that was pretty bad but it was a little fun yeah you know those kind of things so obviously we'll rank them now and then later on we, we may completely change our mind i guess but as of right now i'd say two one three um i'm gonna exclude reboot doctors obviously uh i'd say two obviously at the top i'd say third is maybe tied with the first doctor for me right now I can see that. Um, I, I kind of love James Bond, so <laughs> if you I kind of if you look back on Pertwee's era, and I guess if I rewatched everything, thinking like thinking of him as a James Bond character instead of trying to think of him as like the second Doctor reborn, I think I would enjoy a lot of the stories more. Hmm. So I'm gonna kind of just put him on par with one for now. Uh, obviously, I don't have the brownie points of <laughs> one being my first Doctor, so um, it's kind of weird that. The Twelfth Doctor is also more abrasive than Eleven was. It's kind of almost a parallel from the Second to the Third Doctor, but I actually really enjoy the Twelfth Doctor, whereas mm. I kind of didn't enjoy the Third Doctor. And that, and that might just come down to the... Production values. Production values and also the character's portrayal of being abrasive. I think the Twelfth Doctor is abrasive, but I think he's abrasive in a way that you can tell he really still cares and he doesn't think he's above other people. He's just kind of abrasive in that he's hard to get along with. Huh. Well, I mean, Capaldi has said he was influenced by... Right. Uh, not only the Third Pertwee. Doctor, but also... He's also mentioned that he enjoys the Fourth Doctor in <clears throat> 1 and 2. He, he uh, I think an interesting production note about that was during Death to the Daleks, I think, Barry Letts received a fan letter from a young fan named Peter Capaldi. <laughs> um, I, I think it just comes down to the actor's portrayal, to be honest. And obviously, we'll talk more about that when we get to the 12th Doctor's era and we have 12 Doctors of experience under our belt. <laughs> or 11, I guess, we would have by the time we got there. Uh, you know, I think that just wraps up the Pertwe era. I actually kind of enjoyed season 10, at least. I enjoyed quite a few of his stories. Yeah, and again, maybe if Joe hadn't left, but I, what if? Obviously, what I, if? I will miss him. You miss every Doctor a couple... You, you know, you'll, you'll go a couple weeks and be like, you know, I just kind of miss the previous doctor and then there'll be that moment where you recognize the next person as the doctor like okay the doctor's back no i think i think it's gonna be the opposite for me like this this coming week i'm gonna be like yeah the doctor's back but then later i'll probably be like yeah, yeah i kind of miss yeah it'll take a couple weeks really. and you'll be like you know i could do for a little per- we are not, i'm like, not gonna not, go back and, and rewatch go, his episode you're not so. gonna go back and watch like his whole run at once but maybe like a couple months from now you'll be like you know what i'm kind of got a hankering for the silurians <laughs> sounds almost i kind of have a second doctor hankering right now really just want to like watch you listen to something the second have you doctor, ever gone back I'm surprised we haven't mentioned this like ever like not even on not even off recording but have you ever gone back and watched first and second doctor episodes because i haven't no but i do kind of have a a lingering want to go back and watch something like the moon base actually <laughs> just because i like the cybermen i want the cybermen to come back well just wait a couple more serials I know it's next season, right Four in the title of the, right yeah. in the title of the serial. 
<laughs> yeah. Watch them just show up next week. Robot. <laughs> Poss- possibility. <laughs> uh, yeah. The so ends Pertwee, so begins Tom Baker. You need to make that distinction because there's another Baker that yeah. plays Doctor later. Uh, so we got an email this week, actually. Yeah! Yeah! To our surprise, um... I will read it now. <laughs> Dear Trust Your Doctor Podcast, just wondering if you intend on covering the two 1960s Doctor Who films starring Peter Cushing, yours, Big... Uh, Pig Bin Ron. Uh, we kind of discussed this off recording, obviously, because I don't think either of us remembered if we'd made plans to watch those <laughs> movies. <laughs> Um, we well, we kind of said no. We don't have plans currently. Not um, yet, at least. We decided we I, we discussed. I remember watching these like when when we were recording our first episodes. Like, mm-hmm. hey, should we watch the movies along with the first? The, you know, should we watch the other first Doctor movies? Right. Um, and we kind of decided no, obviously, since that didn't <laughs> happen. Um. But I think we kind of said like, oh, maybe we'll watch, we'll go back and watch these movies before we get to the reboot, which is going to take yeah. years, obviously. But possibly, maybe after the TV movie starring the Eighth Doctor, maybe before. Those are kind of the uh, the dark ages of Doctor <laughs> Who, between the Seventh Doctor leaving the screen and then the Ninth Doctor taking it. It's the dark ages. So well, there may- were, there maybe were books and stuff. That came yeah, out, I so. mean, obviously they kept people entertained with books and. Big yeah. Finish started producing audio dramas in 99, I want to say, maybe 97, yeah. one of those two. But, I mean, the main uh, facet of Doctor Who was missing, so... Uh, so, maybe eventually, but not right now. I think we're kind of overwhelmed doing both this and also putting together triple play episodes, <laughs> since those require quite a bit of mental fidelity and also quite a bit of time. <laughs> Uh, compared to this this podcast, you know, just to get one episode out. But uh, thanks for emailing us. And, yeah, thanks. Uh, so <laughs> look forward to that possibly in three years. Eventually, maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe someday we'll, we'll just be like, I don't want to watch Fourth Doctor. Let's watch Peter Cushing. I don't know. Um, so if you want to email us, like uh, Pig Bin Ron did this week, you can email us at the doctor at decorativevegetable.com. Uh, you know, questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, love letters. We will accept angry rants if you just really <laughs> hate us. Uh, I'm just really curious to see someone email us an angry rant and what that would look like. Please do. Please. Uh, but um, also remember to check us out on uh, YouTube and iTunes, both at Trust Your Doctor. Still got that video exclusive Susan retrospective on our channel. With. Hopefully more to come. Hope soon-ish. eventually. Not maybe not soonish. Maybe not soonish, but eventually. <laughs> eventually. And uh, check us on Facebook and Twitter. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and check out Triple Play. So yeah. Other podcast which is available. Link on the website. From, yeah, that. And next week we finally start the Fourth Doctor with what is probably the most boring serial title yet, Robot. But until then. The end.